Good afternoon. My name is Greg Yowitz, and I'm the board chair of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. Thank you all for joining us as we celebrate our past, catch up with our present, and look to our future for the next hour or so. Hopefully, you've had a chance to visit the exhibit in the atrium before, this, before today's get together to see where we started and look toward the future. If you did, you looked into a mirror and saw your own reflection. You, each of you, are our future. And we will hear more about that later today. At this time, it is my great honor to ask Dr. Heschel Raskus, Federation Board Chair from 2005 to 2007, to lead us in the Devar Torah. Heschel. Good afternoon to all of you. I really appreciate the opportunity to begin the 120th anniversary celebration of our St. Louis Jewish Federation, and especially because it's with the Devar Torah. As a fifth generation St. Louisan, this day indeed is very special for me. It's been some time since I served at what was then called Federation President, since then, I've had opportunities in Jewish communal life nationally and internationally, but not being as deeply engaged here in St. Louis, there are actually many of you I've not met. It would be wonderful to meet. With the permission of our dedicated Federation staff, lay leaders, and communal rabbis, I share the following thoughts. Today's event is being held during a significant week of the Jewish calendar. This year's Pesach Seder is next Friday night. This week before Pesach, before Passover, is a special week in the Jewish calendar. In fact, the Shabbat before Pesach is called Shabbat Hagadol, the Great Sabbath. Why? because we use this week to prepare for the coming days, days that commemorate our greatest historical event as Jewish people, the exodus from Egypt. And what is it we want to accomplish on the Seder night as we gather with family and friends? One answer was given by Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik one of the 20th century's greatest Talmudic scholars and creative minds. He quoted a sentence from the Mishnah, the primary text of the Talmud, quote, in every generation, one must see oneself as if he went out of Egypt. This sentence is also prominent in the Haggadah. He asked, what does this really mean? And he cites a mystical answer. He says, quote, one essentially tells two stories on the night of Passover. One about what happened to a community in a distant land thousands of years ago, and one about what is happening to oneself here and now. He calls this a past-present unity. Isn't Rabbi Soloveitchik's understanding of Passover indeed reminiscent of what we are striving to accomplish today? St. Louis Jewish residents created a new community 120 years ago, a Jewish community that to this very day is rooted in reliving that initiative and at the same time living in the present. This duality is what you might call a past-present unity, as described by Rabbi Soloveitchik. We all embrace the new Jewish community of 1902, and at the same time strive to build a community that rests on that foundational act and adds new layers to enhance and strengthen our community 
for years to come. Our reality builds on Jewish communities around the world as they sometimes struggle and sometimes celebrate, remembering that we witnessed the birth of the State of Israel, a dream fulfilled after generations. And at the same time, we are constantly challenged to build a strong, enduring community here in St. Louis. This very month, we are doing our absolute best to help our Jewish brothers and sisters who may still be in Ukraine or have left to make Aliyah or find a new home elsewhere. These are our Jewish Federation stories, the unity of past and present that define our challenges for the future. How can we best meet these challenges? Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, our inspirational leader who we were fortunate to have visit St. Louis in 2015, had a relevant suggestion in his last book, a book he published about the Torah portions. In Rabbi Sachs's commentary on the Torah portion with the Hebrew name Bo, Bo in the book of Exodus, the portion which describes key events related to the exodus from Egypt, he quoted an American author named Bruce Feiler as follows, quote, the single most important thing that you can do for your family may be the simplest of all, develop a strong family narrative. Rabbi Sachs notes that as the 10th plague was about to strike, Moses knew it would be his last chance to talk to the Jewish people before the Exodus. He prepares the people for freedom, but he does not talk about liberty. Moshe instead talks about children. For example, quoting one of the sentences in the book of Exodus, and you shall explain to your child on that day it is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. Rabbi Sachs points out that Moses doesn't talk about the events to come during the Exodus, but he speaks about events far into the future. He exhorts every Jewish generation to fulfill its responsibility to transmit the story to the future. So Moses' plea is echoed by what Bruce Feiler said, quote, the single most important thing you can do for your family may be the simplest of all. Develop a strong family narrative. In closing, I urge each of us individually and communally as members of our Jewish Federation community to be rooted in the accomplishments of past generations and in our generation to strive to build that strong Jewish future. To achieve that goal, we really need to each individually invest in building an enduring and vibrant Jewish family narrative for each of us, starting anew with the coming Seder night. We have six days till that Seder night. Let's each devote some time during these days to preparing our own Jewish story. Thank you. Thank you, Heschel. Joining us to celebrate this 120th anniversary are some of our friends from the U.S. and Missouri legislatures, as well as St. Louis County, St. Louis City, and of course, the governor's office. In fact, the governor wrote us this letter. So the letter reads, greetings from the governor's office. I am pleased to congratulate the Jewish Federation of St. Louis on your 120th anniversary. What a wonderful and legendary milestone. Since founded in 1901, the Jewish Federation of St. Louis continues today serving approximately 30,000 households 
90,000 individuals and supporting over 55 organizations in the region, creating a vibrant Jewish community. Your support and services in St. Louis and around the world have, has ensured a thriving Jewish community who responds to emergencies and provides care for the most vulnerable. I send best wishes and continued success for your organization. Again, congratulations on your 120th. Sincerely, Michael L. Parson, Governor. Very nice. We thank the governor for those kind words. Also joining us today, we welcome senior community liaison Jackie Winship from the Office of Congresswoman Ann Wagner, who has brought a congratulatory letter from the Congresswoman's office. Uh, I would ask Jackie to please stand. Thank you. I'd like to also recognize Outreach Director Danielle Spradley from the Office of Congresswoman Cori Bush. Thank you very much for coming. Our own Missouri Senator Jill Shoup is here with us today, and I understand would like to share a few words with us. Thank you, Greg. Wow, the microphone was sort of at the right height. That's interesting. <laughs> so um, first of all, let me just say, it is so great to be back here and see all of you again. For us to be part of a community again uh, warms my heart, and I hope it does yours too. I have a resolution from the Missouri Senate. I am the Missouri Senate's Jewish legislator. Um, <laughs> And, and frankly, the resolution is not, is not unlike what the governor sent you. So I don't know, maybe I am gubernatorial material. Just kidding. OK. But <laughs> I'm really not running for office. So but what I want to say to you is this. I was thinking a lot about this date and these 120 years. And 120 years ago, my grandparents were, were being born. They were a few years old or, or not quite born yet. So, and 120 years ago, the state of Missouri was 80 years old. The Jewish community knew even then that we needed to support this community and beyond. We needed to do things together for each other and for others. And my grandparents, two of whom were born here on my mom's side, and my paternal grandparents who were born in Russia and came here, always had a place, and, and they needed a place, quite frankly. Uh, always had a place that they could go when they needed services, and those same kinds of services and even more continue to be available to them today. So I am so grateful to be here. To all of you who have served in various roles in the Jewish Federation over the years, I want to say personally thank you. Um, and it's so great to know that going forward, there will be at least another 120 years. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Oh, there's Bill. <laughs> awesome. I'll, okay, I'll thank, thank you. Thank you. It says Senator Shoup. I'm just going to say thanks, Jill. Um, <laughs> known each other a little while. Uh, we're also joined today by Missouri Representatives LaDonna Applebaum and Doug Clemens, who I understand also have something to share with us. Hi everyone, I'm State Representative LaDonna Applebaum and this campus is in the 71st district and I've been thrilled to represent this area and this community. With redistricting, it's changing. So we can look at it like this if we're on the same theme. There is the, uh, the past, which was Representative Sue Meredith. I am the present. And this is the future. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Doug Clements, he will be uh, representing this district, and I'm very happy about that. And we have a, well, why don't you come in? 
we have a we have a resolution from the Missouri State House of Representatives. Um, I, my name is Doug Clemens. I am the state representative who will be taking over here in January. Um, I'm flattered and honored to be here. Um, tradition is is big deal, and making sure that people have a place to touch base is important for so many of us in a community. So I, I look forward to working with everyone in this room. Um, my cell phone is available. I actually answer, and I'm proud to be here. Thank you. Here comes the cameraman again. We, we got to do the camera okay. stuff. Okay. So. Here we'll go. You want to hold see. it? Yeah. We'll, we'll go on either side of you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, hold no, on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're gonna move over to give me no, no, no. Got it, okay. You got it? All right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. We are literally embarrassed with the riches of support of the community uh, from around the United States and locally and from the Missouri House. So just to all of our representatives, uh, thank you for being here. We also have a representative from Mayor Tashara Jones's office. Please welcome Chief Equity Officer Vernon Mitchell. Good afternoon. I'm so delighted to be here uh, on behalf of the Mayor of St. Louis, Tashara Jones. I bring uh, greetings and celebrations for you all for 120 years. Uh, what I have with me is a proclamation. Uh, if I could read, it, it, I would, it says, whereas on November 7th, uh, 1901, the, Saint, uh, the city of St. Louis, a committee of 100 persons assembled at the Columbian Club and decided to organize the Jewish Charitable and Educational Union to serve the Jewish community and whereas 120 years later, the Jewish Federation of St. Louis, formerly known as the Jewish, Char Jewish Charitable and Education Union, continues today serving approximately 30,000 households. 90,000 individuals and supporting 55 plus organizations in the region, creating a vibrant Jewish community. And whereas the Jewish Federation of St. Louis has four foundations to support their work, which include the Kranzberg Family Foundation, the Lubin Green Foundation, the Steinberg Family Foundation, and the Women's Auxiliary Foundation for uh, Jewish Aged. And whereas the Jewish Foundation of St. Louis has been home to the St. Louis Kaplan. Feldman Holocaust Museum, which opened in 1995, the result of hard work and passion for the local community and local survivors, and now is currently undergoing a $21 million camp, uh, cap expansion campaign, which will quadruple the size and the space to ensure the museum and, as a community uh, resource for decades to come following the grand reopening in the late summer of 2022. And whereas, last one. <laughs> On behalf of the city of St. Louis, it is my great pleasure to congratulate the members of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis on this milestone anniversary, and I extend my best wishes for continued success in the years to come. Now, I, therefore, Tashara O. Jones, Mayor of the City of St. Louis, do hereby proclaim April 10th, 2022, as Jewish Federation of St. Louis Day in the City of St. Louis. In the witnesses there whereof, I have Hereunto set my hand, caused the affixed seal of the city of St. Louis on this 10th day of April, AD 2022. Mayor Tashara O. Jones. Congratulations. Now we have to do the picture. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm out of real estate. I'm going to hand this to Brian. Okay, and earlier today, <laughs> County Executive Dr. Sam Page stopped by and shared this proclamation from the county. We're sort of proclamation heavy. Oh, there it is, it's on the screen, there we go, okay. I can't see behind me. That's not the trick they've taught me as chair. So, um, so it's just wonderful. We're amazed by the support. Uh, and humbled that all of our leaders took the time out uh, to be here today or to send letters, uh, send representatives, uh, drop off proclamations. So uh, thank you so much. Now, we also have groups of our own who we would like to honor, and I'd ask you to stand for recognition. Well, all of those 
all those of you who have served on our board of directors over the past 120 years, please stand. <laughs> However, I do want to add that if you did serve on the initial board 120 years ago, you're allowed to remain in your seat. We'd also like to recognize our Council of Life members. If those of you who are on our Council of Life would also please stand, even though the board members already sat down. Thank you all for all your wonderful years of service to this organization. I know it's not done yet. If you think it's done, I'll be happy to talk about that later. So we've been honored to have you work so hard for our Federation and our community, and we're only successful because of your commitment through the years. Now, we continue to reminisce and look back at our past. And who better to do that for us than one gentleman who has served the Federation for nearly 20 years? Barry Rosenberg began as president and CEO in 1993 and is the longest to hold the position by one year. Still holds the longest. You can check the banners at the exhibit to make sure we got the math right. And I just want to note, Brian, you have 18 more years to go until you get to 20. So please join me in welcoming Barry. Uh, Greg, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a plaque for you today. <laughs> and, and if I'm here to tell the history, I think uh, Mayor, Mayor Jones did a lot, a lot better than I probably would have been. Um, so it feels really nice to be here. Um, see all friends, join in the celebration of Jewish Federation's 120 years. Spanning 120 years of monumental changes in the makeup, the needs, the character of the American Jewish community through monumental tragedies, great victories, and daily challenges that I firmly believe that the Federation idea, an idea that became the model for the United Way, and more than that, our performance has demonstrated that we are stronger, more secure, and more creative when we work together as one community. Today, I'd like to share a bit of history and several perspectives on the evolution of Federation nationally and here in St. Louis. Now, I entered the Federation world in 1979 and served 14 years in New Jersey, the last eight as the chief executive. I wasn't there for 1967 and the transformative impact of the Six-Day War, which catapulted Israel's security to the very top of the Federation agenda, with a profound impact on fundraising, on our allocations, and on the focus of our leadership. Here in St. Louis, annual fundraising doubled from about $1.6 million to a total of $3.5 million overnight incorporating an Israel emergency fund that functioned all the way through 1973 in the Yom Kippur War. The portion of the allocations allocated for overseas purposes to the Jewish Agency and the Joint Distribution Committee grew from an average in the mid-40% range to mid-60s. And by 1974, the Federation raised just under $7 million. The focus on Israel also elevated Federation to a level of prominence it had lacked in the late 1950s and early 60s, when Jewish wealth and leadership flowed primarily to Jewish hospital, the JCC, and our congregations. Now, the Federation world I experienced when I arrived here in 1993. Can, was that funny? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this was the money point of the speech, and there you're looking at that. OK. <laughs> the Federation world that I experienced when I arrived here in 1993 uh, continued to be heavily shaped by our international agenda. Israel advocacy and security, collapse of the Soviet Union, Operations Exodus, Moses, and Solomon, the rescues of Syrian Jews, Quara Jews, and Kurdish refugees, the first Gulf War, the two intifadas, caring for Jews left in the Soviet Union, 
and rebuilding Jewish life there, emergency campaigns and solidarity missions. And tragically, it's feeling like old times as Federation revisits that role and responds to the slaughter in Ukraine. Now, the growth in fundraising also benefited domestic needs because a rising tide actually lifted both boats and pushed St. Louis's annual campaign to exceed $10 million. That financial ability strengthened leader, Federation's leadership position and its ability to convene the community around a common planning and problem-solving table. The Federation's convener role is, I believe, a unique and critical value. It's been required frequently, such as during the 2007-8 financial crisis when I was here, and most recently during the pandemic. So I arrived here in August 1993, and I immediately brought an end to the Great Flood. <laughs> a few of the big topics we were dealing with then were the signing of the Oslo Accords, the opening of the Holocaust Museum, the creation of BJC Healthcare, followed by the merger of Barnes and Jewish Hospitals in 1996. And we were conducting then a Jewish population study, which was in part to illuminate the work of what we called then a West of 270 task force. A big question then was how the community would better serve the westward population flow. My era, co my era coincided with enormous infrastructure building the Maryland Fox Building, the expanded JCC Steinberg Family Complex, the Allen Hoffman JFS Building, as well as renovations and expansions to the Coppolo Building, Covenant Apartments, Washington University Hillel, the Crown Center, and new institutions like the Mirowitz School and Missouri Tor Institute. However, it's important to remember that we also experienced a terrible loss with the default and sale of the Jewish Center for Aged. And we saw the former Jewish vocational service transition into MERS goodwill. There were also programmatic innovations, notably the naturally occurring retirement community. And one of the greatest areas of program expansion was in Jewish identity and I Jewish education and identity building. But back then, that wasn't really assured. I, I arrived here shortly after the 1990 National Jewish Population Study that uh, famously found that intermarriage was now in excess of 50% of the population. And that pushed questions of Jewish identity to the foreground. However, there was debate and much resistance to a federation role in funding day schools then. And there was tension between funding for domestic purposes, social services, as opposed to funding for Jewish identity building. I believe, I hope, that this tension has largely been resolved. And then a number of wonderful programs emerged, like the Reuben Israel Experience, One Happy Camper, and PJ Library. Of course, none of this happens without superb leadership, both volunteer and professional. I owe an enormous debt to the nine board chairs, nine board chairs, and hundreds of staff members I had the privilege to partner with. And I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to my wife, Barbara, who came here with me to St. Louis, stayed with me, and provided <laughs> incredible support over all of those years. And she continues to do that now. I want to give particular thanks to Michael Newmark and Mike Litwack, who are here, who chaired the search committee that brought me here. You can blame them. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> However, a look at my era must include a pre an appreciation of Tom Green, who really sat at the center of almost every major Federation effort, certainly the emergency campaigns for Israel. He launched, uh, he, I'm sorry, he launched and then inspired endowment giving with the creation of the Lubin Green Foundation. He positioned Federation on the international stage and he partnered with me on two of the initiatives of which I'm most proud. He made an extraordinary multi-year commitment to fund what we called then the, the Professional Excellence Initiative, which Marcy Eisen has skillfully nurtured into the Millstone Institute and J. Pro St. Louis. This is an area where we are a true national leader. The second addresses the place of Israel in Jewish life, 
a question of ongoing communal tension and discussion. Now, when I came from New Jersey, support for Israel was really the heart of Federation activity. However, here, I perceived a greater hesitancy, even some ambivalence. Now, I believe that the vitality of American Judaism is deeply intertwined with Israel. However, engagement needs to be more than abstract. And with Tom, we launched Partnership Together, formerly Partnership 2000 with Yokneam and Megiddo, to create a home base in Israel and to create dynamic people-to-people -people relationships. This led to a deeper, I think more nuanced, and wider philanthropic footprint supporting many important organizations there, though in truth proportionally less than we previously did. Now, although connections to Israel have strengthened since I arrived and the community continues to rally in times of crisis, this tension is intensified. Some reflect anger over orthodox religious dominance and frustration with Israeli policy. But I think it also interacts with the tension between Jewish particularism and universalism. Historically, the St. Louis Jewish community was heavily shaped by classical reform Judaism with its strong social justice ethos. And St. Louis has been a leader in community relations and interfaith work. And Lord knows that the challenges of systemic racism demand our attention. However, negativity about Israel demographic changes, assimilation, and a perception of less in need for distinctly Jewish services have all affected how the community perceives the imperative of Jewish needs, both domestically and overseas. And finally, reflecting on changes in philanthropy and donor behavior, there has been an enormous change in fundraising. On one hand, the lion's share of direct solicitation shifted from volunteer to professional. Even more significantly, the approach shifted from one of peer influence, often pressure, and a sense of Jewish obligation to one centered on the needs, interests, and style of the donor. And finally, a shift in allegiance away from a central federated campaign to targeted giving. Now, this is perhaps unavoidable. These change, because this may be unavoidable, these changes have significantly complicated the Federation mission. And I believe in many ways are unfortunate. Because at its core, the Federation was always about community building, about bringing together a diverse population to rally around the needs and aspirations of its people, to build bonds of collaboration and friendship, and sustain a strong community institution that is capable of providing real leadership in times of crisis. That's why Barbara and I remain major donors and why in December, Lori, Lori Wishney will call me again to nag me about my solicitations. <laughs> Thank you for the honor to have served and to be with you today. I wish Greg, Brian, and the entire Federation team continued success and, and strength. Ad Rim bis 120 to another 120 years. Great. Barry, we thank you for your service. I'll put the mic down to the short guy height again. Um, and for joining us today. Your contributions to our success over the years are immeasurable. We also want to acknowledge another former leader who couldn't join us today. Andrew Rayfeld served as CEO and president from 2012 to 2018. Andrew did send his congratulations to the Federation and the community on this occasion, and we thank Andrew for all of his years of service here. Okay, so after that wonderful look backward, we're going to take a few leaps forward to today, or at least since the last time we met, which was virtually a year ago. After a very challenging two years, tonight we are here to celebrate what we've accomplished as a community for over 120 years, and a number of deserving leaders, staff, and a community-focused company. In September of 2019, when I accepted the role of board chair, I laid out a number of initiatives I wanted our community to focus on during my term. Thankfully, the first objective was to find a dynamic new CEO to lead our community, which we completed before the end of 2019, 
and brought Brian on with his first day being January 6th of 2020. <laughs> what came next was anything but what we all expected. Brian has been the CEO we all desired and he has helped steer the community through what may have been the most challenging time in our Federation's history. Back in 2019, I said, I believe we need to maintain a clear focus on Jewish unity to embrace, honor, and celebrate the incredible diversity within our Jewish community. There are so many ways we as Jews live our lives. In a world where it is more common to think about what separates us, we must follow the words of the prophet Isaiah and be a light unto the nations. We must come together for our community and become an example of what is possible. I could not be prouder of how we as a community did just that in response to the pandemic and the challenges that were thrown our way. We found ways together as a community to ensure that all of the community partners we had in 2019 are still around in 2022. Lay leaders, both lay and staff, came together twice a week at first and now monthly to help each other and work together to strengthen our community. Our new community impact model was fully up and running, which I believe provided our investor donors a clear way to understand the work, our work, and for our community partners, a more straightforward process to access funding. All of this making our community stronger, even if mostly over Zoom. As a part of my speech in 2019, I focused, not unlike Heschel, on Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, in my case, on his seven principles of Jewish leadership and his teaching. Please look at those principles on the screen now. I am pleased to say, I am proud to say, I am honored to say, we have made progress in every single one of these seven principles. I believe we as a community, through our actions during the last two years, embodied the words of Rabbi Lord Sachs, who said, Jewish unity is a cause that is not advanced by the advocacy of one point of view over another. It demands the difficult but not impossible exercise of thinking non-adjectively as a Jew, not as a member of this or that group, but as a member of an indivisible people. Our community worked together as one people to help those in our community in need and came together as one, something that brings me immense pride. All of this, if all of this was not enough, Federation has embarked on a landmark endeavor to create a regionally significant, relevant, and state-of-the-art new Kaplan-Feldman Holocaust Museum, a facility that will not only speak to the atrocities of the Holocaust and highlight our local survivors, but it will provide leading-edge relevant skills training to help everyone in our community address bias and hate, not only of Jews. I look forward to seeing all of you in a few short months when we open the museum this fall. Being board chair and a real estate developer, I have immense pride in what we are creating, and I really can't wait to share it with our community and the greater St. Louis community. The path these last two and a half years have taken was not what I expected. However, we are achieving new heights together as a community and are on the verge of so much more. We have over these last 120 years achieved so much and so much is ahead if we continue to work together as one community. Federation has continued to evolve how we do our work and engage with our community partners. And as that evolution continues, Federation is positioned to make a greater impact in our community by bringing more people to the table and providing more resources to bear to address the challenges we currently and will face in the future. Those resources, both financial and human capital, will, as a result, be deployed in efficient and effective ways. As we saw with the COVID crisis, Federation's new operating model can nimbly react to challenges as they come using data and information so resources are deployed quickly and effectively and provide our donor investors and volunteers with the return they expect, which is to create the engaged and secure Jewish, vibrant Jewish community and very bright future for everyone. What we do at Federation matters. Thank you all for what you have done and what you will do because now is our time to act. And one last thing, one of the benefits of having an extended term as chair, uh, which I am happy to uh, 
talk about later is uh, I recently came back from Poland uh, and saw the work of our people uh, on the border with Ukraine. And it's not for a conversation today, but I just want to let you know that um, I'm happy to tell you all about that when time permits. So another voice from our present is our new CEO, who well, is not really new anymore, uh, and President Brian Herstig. Brian arrived at an auspicious time, just shortly before the world changed, which now seems like forever. I can certainly say with no hesitation that we have weathered the storm that shook the entire world because of Brian's dedication and leadership. Brian? All right, so one of the things about speaking later on is that I'm gonna repeat some things that, uh, that you've already heard, so I'll try to move through those quickly, but thank you, Greg. And welcome to all of you here in the room and those of you joining us online on Facebook Live. It's nice to see you. It is so nice to be back together in person. At the end of the day, as Barry said, Federation is a community building organization and it's really difficult to build community without being together. These past two years, quite frankly, I think for all of us have been hard, but I've been really impressed by the way our staff and all of you adjusted to new ways of connecting while physically gathering was not possible. And I'm most impressed with the way that this institution stepped up to support and build community in the most difficult time almost all of us can remember. I don't mean just uh, the almost $1 million we raised in our role as funder through our COVID response fund to support and meet the emerging and changing needs of the community, that was important. And it provided vital help and assistance in the areas of food security, financial support, capacity building for our partners, and extended mental health support. I also mean, as Greg mentioned, the role we played as convener of the community's leadership, both volunteer and professional, at the beginning of this crisis. And it continues through today. These regular Zoom meetings were and are an opportunity to gather virtually, hear and see from one another, share news, concerns and ideas, and provide support in a really, really uncertain time. Uh, they allow us to continue to build the networks and relationships among our Jewish ecosystem in town. Though this work, through this work, we ensured that no one was left behind. None of our clients or members, and as Greg alluded to, none of our partner agencies either. We are still seeing the benefits of these gatherings today. And while all of that extraordinary and unprecedented work was occurring, the regular work of this organization went on. So. We updated our strategic plan to account for the way that priorities that were set in 2017 were being enacted by our partners and ourselves in the real world. Part of that strategic plan says that Federation shouldn't do work that can be done better by another organization. And so, as Barry mentioned, after 10 years at Federation, we transitioned NORC, the naturally occurring retirement community, to JFS the direct service organization in the community that it best fit with and will allow it to grow and thrive. We completed our first major bylaws revision in over 15 years, ensuring our governance is appropriate for the work and philanthropic environment we find ourselves in. Special thank you to Susan Goldberg for heading that process. <clears throat> it was a lot of work. And we continue the work on, as Greg mentioned, the incredibly important St. Louis Feldman Kaplan Holocaust Museum. Not just building a $19 million facility in a pandemic, but raising close to $22 million total to date, thanks to the continued leadership of Carol Steinberg. I'm not good. We've also began to transition that organization from a largely volunteer-led program to a full-fledged museum that will be one of the crown jewels of this community and the entire region. Our community work, which you saw on display today, continued unabated, monitoring and responding to threats on behalf of the entire community. We are all too aware anti-Semitism is on the rise again and the work that Scott Biondo and his team do to prepare and protect all of us and our institutions is outstanding.
And on that, l let me just say for one minute, um, the growth of anti-Semitism and the evolving nature of terrorism and hate in this country will continue to be one of the largest areas of concern and focus we will have over the coming decade. As a community, we need to be even more prepared to face what is coming. And through all of that, thanks to your support and investment, we also saw two extremely successful years of total financial resource development on behalf of the community. We raised over $16 million a year in both of those years, which includes the annual campaign, the Holocaust Museum fundraising, our COVID response fund, and supplemental giving. And future commitments to our foundation, the Center for Jewish Legacy, are not even included in that number. This, I believe, speaks to the depth of support and trust this community has in us as a federation and the institutions that have been created to serve all of us. The annual campaign in particular is the backbone of our community. And with investors and partners like you, our donors, it has built and keeps strong the Jewish community here and around the world. OK, so with 120 years behind us, what lies in front of us? One of the first things is to recognize the changing nature of our community. Our last community study was done in 2014, and I think it's pretty safe to say we have changed. So we will begin embarking on a new community study in the coming year to understand who we are and how we have transformed so that we collectively can continue to evolve to meet the community's changing and change, changing needs. You will hear a little bit later a little more about our Courageous Leadership Initiative, but it is an opportunity for us to address the continued breakdown of true discourse and listening that is plaguing our society at this time. The lack of understanding, empathy, and dialogue is dangerous for accepting and building diversity. And if we hope to continue to be a thriving community, we must address it. I want to thank each of you here today, congratulate the award winners, uh, recognize the work of the board and those who serve on committees, and most of all, I want to acknowledge and thank the outstanding group of people I am privileged to represent, to work with, and to learn from every day, the staff of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. And one last note of appreciation and recognition. Greg Yawitz will now become the longest serving board chair since World War II. Um, his dedication, enthusiasm, pragmatism, and really partnership in a difficult time and in a situation where whatever plans and hopes he had for his term went out the window. They have been tremendous. He is a true partner in this work and the community owes him a thank you and possibly a shot or two of whiskey. <laughs> Finally, on a personal note, this has been a very unique time for me and my family. We got here less than two months before COVID started, had to navigate a new community, a new city during a lockdown. After having a baby three months ago, it was so nice to see the warmth and welcoming that this community has shown us. It's one of the reasons we chose to move here, and it continues to be a strength of the St. Louis Jewish community, so thank you. <laughs> one of the tra traditions we've carried over from our annual meeting days are the presentation of awards for leadership and corporate responsibility. At the end of the day, our community is made up of individuals and the institutions within it. There is no greater honor than to be recognized by your peers as a leader uh, in the community. Tonight, we honor several very worthy individuals and a community partner who have all shown their commitment to Federation. To help with this portion, to start, I would like to introduce Sheila Greenbaum. Sheila was board chair from 2007 to 2009, and she will be presenting the David N. and Rosalind Grossberg Young Leadership Awards. Thank you, Brian. It is a pleasure to be here. These volunteer leaders are being recognized as outstanding, active leaders in the federated community. 
The David N. and Rosalind Grossberg Young Leadership Award was established in, <laughs> I wasn't so lucky, Jill, in, 19, <laughs> in 1961 by the Grossberg family. This year's Grossberg Young Leadership Award goes to two very deserving people for their exceptional leadership, Abby Goldstein and Dahlia Oppenheimer. Unfortunately, Abby has a family matter to attend to out of town. But fortunately, we are live streaming, so she is watching right now. One of the very distinctive things about this award is that it is recognition in real time that serves to inspire others. Both Abby's and Dahlia's individual paths and activities make me very proud of them as exemplars of the St. Louis Jewish community. Please turn your attention to the screens to learn more about their stories, and you will certainly see demonstrations of how to maximize 24 hours each and every day. Good leadership is about connection and stewardship. It's about working well with each other, working respectfully with each other, being positive and collaborative to get the work done. And that stewardship aspect means taking your responsibility seriously. There are people counting on you, there's institutions counting on you, there's a community counting on you, and your ability to work well together. I was raised in a family where serving your community is the ultimate responsibility. It's something that we take very seriously. And the opportunity to get involved and see how I could help, that's my responsibility. I think what's incredible about Dahlia is when there's an issue or a situation, she looks at it from every different perspective. She takes this full and complete view of it, and she asks really tough questions that really help get to the bottom of the issue. Dahlia has been involved in so many things throughout the community. She was actively involved in Epstein Hebrew Academy and Base Abraham Congregation for the Federation. She's been on the Board of Directors. She was on the Assessment and Planning Subcommittee. She was also on the Pomegranate Event Committee for Women's Philanthropy, and this year she is the chair of the Lion of Judah and Pomegranate event for women's philanthropy. So she has been actively involved. When she shows up at something, she brings her full self. She is completely and totally there and she gives everything. Every community partner has a mission that is so important. Federation pulls all of that together. No one falls through the cracks. It's the idea that as a community, we don't have room for division. We have to welcome voices at the table, and we have to think really methodically about how we can stay strong. Federation has inspired me to care about not just the individual community partners, but to think about how can we all be stronger together? How can our whole community benefit from the learning of each of those individual institutions? Dahlia has a way of bringing to the table um, analytical skills and a thought process that is um, so pragmatic. She was very important to the Assessment and Planning Committee of Community Impact last year. And when there was an opportunity to select a new co-chair, we jumped to invite Dahlia to serve in that role. And she graciously accepted and we're really looking forward to her applying those skills as a leader of that committee and uh, really developing. I want St. Louis to be a great place for a long time to come. And so knowing that Epstein Hebrew Academy had been there for 75 years, I got involved so I could make sure that it was still there for another 75. You talk to the teachers, you talk to the administration, you talk to the parents, and you realize that Jewish education is about tradition in motion. It's about how we take our past and how do we revitalize it, connect to it, and make it vibrant for years to come. I hope that I can pass along to my children how important it is to take care of our community and to take care of it in a way that makes them proud to be part of the community, that makes them realize we rely on the work that we do together. We rely on the work that we do for each other, for today and for generations to come.
my husband and I both noticed that everything happening in St. Louis in our lives, the music class we attended, the synagogue we go to, were all somehow supported through Federation. We realize it's not just our dollars going abroad, which is so important and so meaningful, but also we're really making a difference here. And after that moment, I think is when I decided I wanna get more involved. I wanna make a difference in my community. Abby Goldstein is such a rock star volunteer. She has this engaging personality and positive attitude that everyone just wants to be around her. And as a professional, she is somebody that you want to have on your side and to work with. Abby believes in giving back. She has been involved in many aspects of volunteerism, not even just Jewish. She also is the president of her PTA right now. It has been a deliberate choice for her. Abby is currently on the Women's Philanthropy Board and serves as our Vice Chair of Engagement. Part of her job is really thinking through how are we making what we're doing in Women's Philanthropy welcoming for all women across the community. Abby chaired L'Chaim in 2020. We had no idea what a virtual event was at that point. And Abby really came in again with that positive attitude and helped us think creatively about how to make this event a success. It was important to her and the chairs that we included a special L'Chaim box that brought L'Chaim into their living rooms. We had something that we didn't anticipate and we needed to do something different half an hour before it started. And Abby stepped up. She was phenomenally great at interviewing our guest speaker. It was really a remarkable show of leadership and warmth and an ability. I was so impressed with that. I'm now a member of uh, JFNA's National Young Leadership Cabinet. And through Cabinet, I've met some really amazing and inspiring leaders in other communities. And I've learned from them and I'm able to take their passion, their commitment, the things that they're doing and bring it back to St. Louis. When COVID hit, the Harvey Kornblum Food Pantry stopped having guests come in and shop. And Abby stepped up and she has been delivering food to shut-in families. Every week I would pack my three kids in the car and they would go with me to the stops and sometimes they would get out and help me deliver groceries to the door. I want my kids to know the value of giving back and that doing something so small like delivering groceries can make a huge difference to someone else. We all have a place where we can get involved and it's a matter of finding what it is for you. And so I really hope that my involvement and the things I'm doing inspire our friends, our family, other young people to take a more active role in our Jewish community. We would now like to invite Dahlia to come forward to receive her commemorative plaque. We're giving them out as well as getting them. <laughs> and um, we will have Abby's plaque upon her return to St. Louis. Because of the generosity of the Grossberg family, um, in addition to the plaques, we are honored to give each of our recipients a significant honorarium to attend a leadership or Jewish education program of their choice. So, At this time, I'd like to ask all past honorees of the David N. and Rosalind Grossberg Young Leadership Award to stand and be recognized. Come on, I know they're alumni here. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Now it's too low. Okay, there we go. Uh, I would like to now introduce our next presenter, who is also a past board chair. Patty Krogan served as chair from 2013 to 2015. Patty, would you please come up?
I have on heels. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. It is really wonderful to see everyone again. Um, it's, for everybody, been a very long couple of years, so it's especially warm and, and just invigorating, really, to see everybody. But today, it is my special honor to recognize two outstanding women with the Fred A. Goldstein Award for Professional Leadership. This award is presented by Federation every year to professionals in the community who have worked for at least five years and made significant impact. This year's recipients, Patty Bloom, Director of Admissions at the Saul Mirowitz Jewish Community School, and Karen Scher, Vice President of Community Leadership and Engagement of the Jewish Federation, are women of vision, creativity, passion, warmth, and great good humor. And I have had the great good fortune of working closely with them both. Please join me now in watching this video celebrating their leadership and accomplishments. There is this quotation from Proverbs 22, 6 that says, educate others in the way they should go, and when they're older, they'll not depart from it. And that has always inspired me. I, I just love it because it's a reminder that we have one chance to get it right for our kids. And we need to make Jewish learning meaningful and joyful for them. Patty is our Director of Admissions and Marketing. She oversees the entire admissions process from recruitment to enrollment. She forms relationships with their families and helps make the connection between what she knows to be the future and what their children need in order to be a significant part of that future. She is responsible for every student who has enrolled. If parents are hesitant about coming into the school or have concerns, she is the person that will make them feel that this is the best environment for their children. Patty is incredibly creative. She's also responsible for marketing, and that includes all areas of the school. She comes up with such joyful and wonderful new things. She creates some new slogan or a new program or a new idea for a collaboration that just nails it. If we look at the colors of the name of the school outside, she's the one that shows those colors. It's bright, it's happy, it's inviting. Anyone walks into the building, if they say nothing else, they would say, it's such a happy place. Patty is involved in the Jewish community, not just here at Mirowitz. She's on the board of Temple Israel, where she's a very active longtime member. She is a Lion of Judah at the Jewish Federation and very active there. She'll do anything for Jewish Federation except for leave Mirowitz, <laughs> which I'm very grateful for. As a volunteer, she got the Grossberg Award for being that excellent as a professional. She's getting the Goldstein Award because she's that excellent in whatever it is that she does. My mom won the same award 20 years ago when she was the Director of Community Relations at the JCA. And she used to drag my sisters and me to her events and I'd go to work with her and see how she interacted with the residents and their families and her colleagues. And she set an example of what it means to devote your career and yourself and your passion to the community. I think the same things motivate me as a volunteer and as a professional. In either role, I'm seeking excellence. In either role, I'm determined to do the best. But I think the key to being a leader is being a part of the solution. I love walking around the school with prospective parents and showing them what awaits them and giving them a chance to imagine their child in our kindergarten class speaking Hebrew and growing as a leader. I love walking them in to watch our third graders reading Torah. This is my 14th year as the school's director of admissions and marketing, and it is not a job for me. It's a calling. I 
I've always been part of the Jewish community, whether it's as a volunteer or a professional. So being part of someone's journeys, hearing how something that we've done has really helped change the way they may see things or do things or connect to their own Judaism. I like being part of that journey for people. It fills me because then I'm constantly learning. <laughs> so part of it is not, not just so much what I feel like I'm doing for them, but what they give to, back to me is so much more. She is constantly thinking about other people, about how they'll take what's going on in, how they'll respond to it, and making sure that we're moving in a direction that is meeting people's needs at the very basic level, while also moving the community forward. Karen is highly committed to becoming a better professional. In the last two years, she's been involved with Focus St. Louis and also at a national level with Mandel Leadership Initiative. I think it's very rare to find professionals who each and every day are striving and putting in the work to become better at what they do. When I think about leadership and what makes a, a really effective leader, I think it's listening, I think it's supporting, I think it's enabling others to find their own answers and not just telling them what to do. I really want to bring people together to be able to create and to find their own successes. When I was working with Young Leadership back in my first stint, which was a pretty long time ago, I really felt like we did some really creative programs. Coming back, I'm really proud of the leadership programs that I've been able to create, develop, facilitate. One of, I know, the most impactful thing that Karen's done is co-starting the Nishma organization, which is now part of the JCC. That organization engages, inspires, and connects Jewish women throughout the St. Louis community. And I know that that has to be one of the proudest things that Karen's done. I was just going through old articles and photos of when we started in 2005 and the women that were around that table. It was just really cool to see something go from, there was nothing there and then creating something that's still here 16 years later. Karen's impact on Federation is immense. She understands the whole organization. She has so many years experience that she understands how her job connects with the rest of Federation and the larger St. Louis Jewish community. She spent time working here and at WashU Hillel then became a volunteer. She won our highest volunteer award and now, really deservingly so, is winning our highest professional award too. That is part of what makes Karen unique. It doesn't matter which side of the table she is on. She has been working tirelessly for 20 plus years to make this community, her community, her home, a better place for people so that they can reach their own potential and find ways to connect with one another. Our work touches the lives of so many people, not just here in St. Louis, but all around the world. And, and to be part of something that's this impactful, that really does change lives, to me, that's why we're here. Good. Patty and Karen, please come forward to receive your award. how you all feel, but I feel like our community is in really good hands with these four women being honored today. Um, and now I would like to ask all past honorees of the Fred A. Goldstein Award who are with us today to stand and be recognized. Sorry, there's a little static on the right. I think it might be this thing. We might have beat it up moving it around too much. OK, so now I would like to welcome Ken Rubin, a partner at Rubin Brown and a good friend of the Federation. 
Reuben Brown has been presenting the Reuben Brown Corporate Partnership Award to an outstanding business partner since 2014. Ken, please join us to share more about this year's Reuben Brown Corporate Leadership Award recipient. Thank you, Greg. Reuben Brown is thrilled to sponsor the Corporate Leadership Award once again this year in continuation of our long association with and support of the Federation. It's vital for corporations to recognize the importance of supporting our community through the Jewish Federation. Our firm has been a major supporter of the Jewish Federation since my father founded the firm in 1952. We created this award to celebrate companies like Reuben Brown that exemplify philanthropic leadership in our community. This year, the Jewish Federation of St. Louis is proud to present the Reuben Brown Corporate Leadership Award to Luxco. Luxco has demonstrated a commitment and dedication to philanthropy that enhances our community in a most meaningful way through the generosity of the Lux family. As today's program celebrates the history of the Jewish Federation, I can personally attest to this family's history. Besides being a longtime classmate of Paul Lux, a golfing buddy of Don, and life lifetime blues fans with both of them, I vividly recall your dad serving on the board of the JCA with me many years ago. Please watch this short video to learn more about why Luxgo is so deserving of this honor. We are a producer of spirit and wine products that we sell throughout the world. You can go back to our roots in rural Arkansas where my grandfather started running whiskey back in the 30s. To where we are today, it's been the same philosophy, real roots, real family, real products. When I first came and joined Luxco many, many years ago, it really happened through Don and his father, Paul Lux. Paul was a very, very generous, kind man, very, very smart guy, very good business head on his shoulder. And, and what I will say through Don is that's been passed on, how they approach the business, how they think about the business, how they think about employees. And it is about a family atmosphere. And it's not just about the Lux family and, and the namesake of our company, but the family that exists in our employees. And at the end of the day, that translates into real products. We bring that spirit of our foundation, the spirit of the family, and translate it into a product that hopefully people enjoy. In times of need, a lot of employees come to me for help. Whatever they need, they know they can call me. I don't have to tell them that, they just do it, which feels really, really good. We take a lot of pride in the employees we bring here and a lot of pride in trying to make sure that they're happy. Happy employees make innovative employees. And when you get employees that produce that, what does it do? It creates profit. And good companies, especially family companies like Luxco, gives those profits back. They're able to make contributions to the community that can make a difference. We're very, very, very fortunate that we've been successful in business and with that, comes a sense of responsibility to take care of the community and give back where we can. And so we do that. And everyone in the company knows we do that. It's something that I love doing. I really enjoy it. It, it gives me great pride. We've given to the St. Louis Zoo. My dad was the chair of the zoo and my parents were animal lovers and Children's Hospital, of course, the Federation. Michelle and I personally do inner city youth, trying to find charter schools or communities that need money, maybe for their reading program or just to give those kids that perhaps don't have the chances that we had as kids growing up a better chance for success. My sense of obligation of giving back to those causes that matter is as strong as it's ever been. I think that's not only something that's shared with me, but I do think I see it in other people. What's been interesting for me as I learn more about Federation and how far the Federation's reach is, is that our philosophies are very similar in our sense of giving back to the community, supporting the community, supporting those less fortunate around us. And when we get an award like the award we got, it's, it's pretty cool because we really don't focus on ourselves. And for someone else to recognize what we've done, it sends a wonderful message and it's really exciting. And it's not why we do it, but I have to tell you, it feels really, really good.
Don and Michelle, please join me up here to accept this award on behalf of Lux Luxco and your family. Here. Come on over here. Good job. Okay, take care. Okay, I'm reading the script and I'm lost. Okay, please turn your attention once more to the screen where you will see a list of the many wonderful, ah, this makes sense now, sorry. Uh, many wonderful companies that have received this honor in the past. It's an amazing list and congratulations. In case it wasn't clear, I do not do this professionally. And now, we turn our attention to the next 120 years. Over the last several years, Jewish communities around the United States have begun experiencing the sharp divisions that seem to go with the times, and our St. Louis Jewish community is no exception. Federation is here because we made a commitment 120 years ago to ensure a vibrant Jewish community, one in which every individual in our community can live their life with dignity, meaning, and purpose. As we look towards the next 120, we are committed to building our vibrant Jewish communities based on our shared values of pluralism, democracy, and civil discourse, while creating a tent that is welcoming, inclusive, and embraces difference. That is why I'm excited to announce the launch of a year of courageous leadership, creating our Jewish community voice, an initiative focused on strengthening the civil communal space by developing a communal discourse that supports, respects, and rewards thoughtful and ethical leaders and grapples with the challenges facing Jewish life today and the nuances of leading in this environment. This initiative will include several components, including small group cohorts of lay and professional leaders, high level skills training, and community wide speakers. This is all made possible by the generosity of the Lubin Green Foundation and the Hank and Chris Weber Ideas and Culture Fund. And it is jointly staffed by Karen Scher and Maharat Rory Pinker -Nice. To learn more about the initiative, please join me in welcoming on the screen Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, a leading thinker and author on the meaning of Israel to American Jews, on Jewish history and Jewish memory, and on questions of leadership and change in American Jewish life. Yehuda led the creation of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America in 2010 as a, pi as a pioneering research and educational center for the leadership of the North American Jewish community, and is the co-creator of the Shalom Hartman Institute's I Engage project, which seeks to bridge, is bridge between Israel and world Jewry through content, curriculum, and cutting edge educational programs. Please turn your attention to the screen and join me in welcoming remotely Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be joining you for this uh, beginning of this learning project with the St. Louis Jewish community and in partnership with the Shalom Hartman Institute. I'm thrilled that our organization uh, is involved with and partnering with you all on these issues that I'm gonna try to lay out today uh, and excited to see what we might do. Uh, as, I'll, as I'll share near the end of today's presentation, uh, I think some of the challenges that we're facing as a Jewish community, in particular Jewish communities and in general in North America, feel enormous. Uh, in many respects, they feel bigger than us. Uh, but our responsibility as leaders is to name the challenges, to do the best we can at actually spelling out the complexity of the challenges. Sometimes we skip that part, get quickly to a quick diagnosis in order to be able to prescribe a quick solution. But if we can really spend our time learning about the challenges and then fortifying, fortifying our ability to actually respond to them, we will be able to make, I think, significant change on behalf of the Jewish people and in service of Jewish history. The idea that I want to share with you today uh, that should prompt our learning and, and hopefully trouble you a little bit today um, is an idea rooted in a little bit of data and manifesting in all sorts of complicated ways across Jewish life. Um, and it's an idea that I think is already having some toxic effects on Jewish life uh, that's going to require us to take really seriously. The central idea I want us to play with today is that the main theater of Jewish life in North America uh, is politics. What I mean by that is that politics occupies or inhabits 
the essential central activity uh, of what it means to be involved in organized and engaged Jewish life. Now, a lot of us don't think that that's the case. We may not think that our own Judaism is, is all that political. But one way in which we can see this is that a community's controversies are witnesses to its values. Tell me what a community is fighting about, and I'll tell you what that community actually takes the most seriously. After all, things that we don't fight about, you know, maybe we don't care that much about. And North American Jewish community does not fight about God. It doesn't really fight about Jewish practice. Um, there are no major fights in the street about Shabbat observance or, or how, what it means to keep kosher. But we do quite... We do fight quite a bit about politics, and we'll talk a little bit about today a few of the places where that takes place. And not only do we fight about politics, which tells us that it's really important to us, uh, how we fight is actually shaped by how one would fight if they wanted to win in a political contest. In other words, we're not merely fighting about politics. We are becoming politicized um, in our community's conflicts by virtue of the fact that this is our central concern. Now, I, I think that this is bad for Jewish peoplehood. Um, number one, the more that we fight around different politics, uh, the less we can see ourselves as one collective, one polity. Right? At one point in time in Jewish history in America, the American Jewish community thought of itself as a polity. That had to do in part with the fact that American Jews were not fully assimilated, didn't fully belong to larger American institutions. Our position as a group was, uh, was much more um, vulnerable. Um, much more suspect. Uh, today, we operate as well as uh, any other Americans do, and we fight about politics the way that other Americans do as well. So that's not great uh, for Jewish peoplehood. Um, when you fight uh, about politics, the nature of that fighting is going to be zero-sum. That's how political fighting takes place, and it becomes harder and harder to see American Jews as belonging to one collective. But I would argue that not only is it bad for Jewish peoplehood, it might be bad for Judaism as well. When the nature of what's uh, at the center of communal life is politics, then Judaism becomes a kind of cloak that sits on top of our politics. You know, how many times have you heard a sermon in a synagogue where you already know the politics of the rabbi, and the rabbi already knows the politics of the congregation, and it all seems to work, right? The texts line up exactly with the political message that is meant to be told us. So now, is that actually a are we actually listening to Torah at that point? Are we growing as Jews, or are we hearing a version of Judaism that lines up nicely with our politics? So the more that Judaism is about politics, it's not necessarily great for Judaism, and it's not necessarily great um, for Jewish peoplehood. Now, the truth is, this story of the politicization of Judaism has been true for a lot of the modern Jewish experience. It actually goes back a couple of hundred years. Uh, in, in many ways, the whole story of, um, of the Jewish people's encounter with modernity was encountering the possibility, and the phrase, of course, of emancipation. That whole story was this belief, then this hope by many Jews with a turn in modernity, that we could think of ourselves or we could be treated, more importantly. Uh, we always wanted to be part of the societies in which we live. We might actually be treated by, in, by those societies as equal members. And what that did was it shifted a tremendous amount of focus in Jewish thought um, among Jewish thinkers and Jewish leaders that the central project of, um, of Jews in modernity was to figure out how to crack the emancipation nut what would we need to do in terms of displacing our own particular commitments in order to be able to belong to the, to the polities in which we sought to belong? And certainly is the case for the rise of Zionism, where um, in part because many Jews believe that the Emancipation Project isn't really working, that we need a different political solution to what was long, for a long time known by the Jew, Jewish people, well before it was known by our enemies, as the Jewish question or the Jewish problem. Something doesn't work about Jews wanting simultaneously to belong to the societies in which we live and yet to hold on to some measure of our own Jewish identity. So for a lot of the last couple hundred years, the main problems that we have tried to solve for as Jews, especially as a collective, have been political problems. Can we be equal citizens? Can we be equal to other nations in the world with our own state? Can we withstand uh, the toxicities of anti-Semitism? Um, so I, it's not, it shouldn't be surprising to us that those issues, right, around Israel, around um, questions of citizenship and membership and democracy and questions of anti-Semitism, it shouldn't be surprising to us that those still define the central communal agenda they have for, for roughly 150 years. 
But there are a couple of specific elements that are afflicting us, I think, as American Jews um, around politics. And, and one is that we are uh, we as Jews don't always create a problems in our communities. We sometimes inherit them um, or we absorb them from the larger culture that we're in. One way of putting this is, I think Isaiah Berlin said, Jews are just like everybody else, but more so. Um, in America today, uh, we know this, all of us are seeing it. Um, certainly, you know it very well in Missouri, uh, of the rise of a culture of partisanship that is taking over America. We are witnessing the greatest um, partisan divide and partisan toxicity in American politics in roughly a century. A lot of us believe that partisanship is in and of itself not a terrible thing, right? The fact that you can have clearly articulated differences of opinion on issues that matter actually can be healthy to some degree, both to the articulation of those positions, but also to a democracy. You always want to have multiple options and serious values debates. But partisanship in America has started to cross over from something that is actually part of like healthy culture to something that feels um, deeply broken um, and possibly, uh, hopefully not irreparable, whether it's in the forms of political violence, whether it's in the forms of the fact that it's the notion that any kind of legislation can actually become bipartisan is incre increasingly rare. And, and by the way, so much of the heyday of American Jews, uh, starting in the middle of the 20th century and for the next 30 or 40 years, the period in which Jews really emerged uh, socially, economically, and politically was in a period of time that was characterized by bipartisanship. So our very story of belonging in America was tied to a different version of America than we currently have. That's, that's, that's alarming. Let me give you one statistic to this effect. So in Jewish communal contexts, a lot of us know to quote the Pew study, which was the study by the, the Pew folks about Jewish identity. Um, but there was a far more significant study that Pew put out that implicates the Jewish community, even though it wasn't about the Jews. It was a 2017 study about partisanship. And like I said, the, the phenomenon of partisanship has become uh, dramatic in America over the last 30 years. And what the thing that the, the Pew folks pointed out is, if you go back to the early 90s and you said, which of the following um, characteristics would define the di difference of opinion most significantly between one American and another one? Race, age, geography, socioeconomic class, religion, or partisan political affiliation. And they all were kind of the same, right? So it's a, it, which of these is the biggest predictor of ideological difference? Fast forward to 2017, all of those categories, race, religion, socioeconomic class, geography, et cetera, um, age, all of them stayed flat, but partisan uh, political identification now is like quadruple those in terms of being a predictor. In other words, the thing that most likely tells us a story of where we deeply disagree with other Americans is who we vote for um, at the ballot box. On some level, that sounds intuitive, but just to know that in the span of 30 years, that story has actually dramatically changed should tell us that the fact that partisanship is now pulling apart the organized Jewish community in America, and many of us as Jews, uh, is not merely because we as Jews are internalizing this, but because Americans are behaving the same ways. There's so much interesting research on this. Uh, Americans are moving geographically to be closer to people they vote with. Um, so we are all collectively behaving in a way that may be counter um, to our collective interest. Of course, the other big story for American Jews on how politics divides us is about Israel. In, in the span of two generations, I never get over how extraordinary this is. In the span of two generations, American Jews turn Israel from being the strongest organizing force in Jewish life to Israel as the strongest disorganizing force in American Jewish life. Congratulations to us. Um, kind of incredible to think that um, this story, which in so many ways, uh, the birth of the state of Israel was transformative to the American Jewish community, wound up playing a central role in the mobilizing of Jewish philanthropy in the middle of the 20th century, uh, enabled American Jews to think differently about power and democracy in ways that were very good for American Jews. It turns out that that is the thing that we, um, it's no longer uh, simply a source of pride that is imported for American Jews. It is not merely a story that helps to mobilize and organize Jewish life but it's something that we are um, inevitably going to fight about. Now, the consequences of this for American Jews um, are quite significant. 
Um, I want to want to focus particularly on leaders because the project that we're doing together here is around leadership and courageous leadership in particular. One consequence for Jewish leaders is that when the central theater and central activity of Jewish life is politics, it it inclines many of us who work in Jewish life, uh, whether on the professional or on the volunteer side, to think of ourselves as political actors. Um, it inclines all sorts of behaviors that politicians might do or political actors might do, or um, the reverse, which is worse, that a lot of us are in this because we love the Jewish people, we, uh, we love the Jewish religion, we love other Jews, we want to do that work, but we're operating in a hazardous political environment, which gets in the way of our capacity to do all of that work with integrity. I'll give you a couple of examples that we see on the Jewish professional side. There's a phenomenon that rabbis talk about um, when rabbis talk to each other, which is called the um, death by Israel sermon. What is the sermon that you're going to give on Israel that's going to get you in trouble? And, um, and you can't avoid it, right? If you decide as a rabbi, you know what, it's too risky for me to speak about Israel because I'm going to alienate one person or another. Well, over the span of 52 weeks, if you give no sermons about Israel, you're also making an ideological claim about whether Israel is a Jewish topic that matters or not. So there's this risky business um, around this work. Uh, we are noticing, it's anecdotal, but it's significant, that a lot of junior professionals, assistant rabbis, assistant Hillel directors, they don't want to become the senior rabbi or the Hillel director, because why would you want to spend your whole life uh, fending off political controversies? If you're the assistant rabbi, I don't know, you could teach the Hebrew school kids and you can still do some weddings and bar mitzvahs. If you're the assistant Hillel director, you can be seriously engaged in Jewish education. But when many get to the corner office, you are dealing with generational challenges between board members and students around the latest political issue as it manifests on campus. You're fending off all sorts of controversies and so forth. And perhaps the most dramatic place where some of this political work is, is really creating toxicity in our community um, are cultures of shame and public campaigns oftentimes against Jewish leaders. Again, lay or professional, sometimes driven by professionals, sometimes driven by lay leaders, sometimes driven by philanthropy that make the business of courageous leadership really dangerous work. And, and the consequence, the composite of all of this is that inevitably the only leaders who can withstand this climate are not necessarily the leaders that you want, right? To have politically savvy Jewish communal leaders may not necessarily mean that you have folks who are in this work for the right reasons. Um, or you might wind up with a bunch of leaders who know how to kind of skirt controversy, but can't necessarily um, lead with moral courage. Uh, maybe we, we wind up with leaders who can survive a political crisis but um, may not necessarily know how to prevent it wherever possible. But, but I think by far the most important concern of this work is how do we make sure that in such a um, tricky and dangerous environment, and in fact in an environment where many of these issues that we characterize as being um, political actually require real moral courage, how do we make sure that um, the work of Jewish life and Jewish leadership um, involves a kind of commitment to stay in that work um, so that not only can our leaders survive this moment, they can actually represent something powerful on behalf of our people. The main idea I want to throw out for you today is that we are meant to understand that categories of the moral, the political, and the partisan are not the same. They exist on a spectrum. Our moral commitments or our religious commitments are big and they are transcendent. Our political strategies are the ways in which we live our moral commitments in the world. And our partisan commitments are the team that we pick among our political choices to play that out. When we collapse all of those things together, inevitably we start to think that those who vote differently from us are our moral enemies. And the minute that happens, I've now cut our political community in half. Part of the work of Jewish leadership right now is to try to articulate broader and more significant moral and religious commitments that we can collectively hold to, even if we believe that in this environment, the political strategies and even the partisan expressions of those are going to be really different and are going to be in, op in opposition to one another. So I've diagnosed for you today so far, I think, a big challenge of a climate that we're in and, and trying to suggest that maybe the way out is to try to figure out 
what we actually might hold in common that can transcend some of these political divisions and try to imagine the ways in which Jewish life and Jewish leadership can return to being a little bit countercultural. Over the course of this year, we're going to do three commitments, and that's, I think, what we're asking folks, to engage in a serious process of study, to understand the Jewish community as it currently is, how we've gotten to this point, and to vision what alternatives might be available to us for Jewish communal life and for Jewish leadership. A second commitment is to try to display some pluralism through practicing it, that we build social fiber, connectivity, trust, and even character witnessing around among Jewish leaders from diff who hold vastly different opinions so that we can become a Jewish community that can withstand um, some of this climate that we're in. And the third is, is some skill building. Um, truly, it's not just about knowledge and relationships, but maybe um, the stronger we are as both professionals and volunteers in noticing the ways that these forces are at, are at work in damaging ways around Jewish life, maybe it's not just noticing it, but it's actually having toolkits to be able to push back. Ultimately, my wish for the St. Louis Jewish community, as it is for um, Jews across North America, is that we find ways to remember um, that we as Jews are bigger than some of the challenges that are around us, um, that we remember that we are committed to really lofty ideas, that we are people who have been carried through history, through the quality of our ideas. And even though we may be facing serious externally created and internally imposed challenges, that through a process of courageous leadership, um, we can still do right by Judaism, Jewish history, and the Jewish people. Thanks very much. Okay, so this ran a little longer than we thought. <laughs> I appreciate all of those of you who were able to stay through the whole program. Thank you for joining us today. As you exit, check out the exhibit. Uh, check out, uh, there's some gift bags for you on the way out. Um, it's really important that you came today. I can't thank you enough for doing that. And for, to all of our award recipients, um, and to Luxco and, and the Lux family, and Susie had to leave, but I was gonna make a joke about how she gave me a bunch of vodka one time um, in Florida, but that's a story for another day. She might have. Um, so thank you all for being here. Have a great rest of your evening. And uh, check out the great, the gift is uh, pictures of artwork that are around the campus from the generous donations of uh, the Steinberg family. Thank you.